Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lords of Limited. My name is Ben Warney, and joining me on the line, as always, Mr. Ethan Marionette Apprentice Sachs. <sighs> that card is your spirit child, my friend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I believe what Ben is referring to is a, a YouTube video that I made courtesy of the Early Access, and we had not one but two Early Access events this week, which was just awesome in terms of collecting some information and getting our hands on the cards. But I got to draft a deck that I thought was like looked kind of clunky. I, I sort of drafted what I thought was two halves of two different decks. But this black green deck sang, my friend, and and Marionette Apprentice, <laughs> which is one of the black for a one two and has fabricate. And whenever a creature or artifact you control dies or goes to the graveyard, rather, um, your opponent loses a life. I didn't realize, I think we even talked about it, but then I forgot about it, how that works with Eldrazi spawn tokens. I said it in the video, but it's a bit of a Splinter Twin situation. Bit of a Splinter Twin situation. That deck was two great tastes that tasted great together. Yeah, yeah, it was not, it didn't feel, it was like, okay, so it's two halves of two decks, but they actually go pretty well together and it worked out. And I kind of feel like I've experienced that a few times in the format where I've like, part of it is like my own like, I feel so excited in the drafts. I'm like, oh, I could do this and I could do this. And then I end up a little, <laughs> a little pulled in, in a few different directions. But it doesn't blow up in my face the way I expect, you know, once yes, I get this, to the games. This format's a very Ethan format, for sure. I think in how <laughs> you want to approach it from drafting, because your, your draft strategy is very like, I have this. This works well with this. Oh, there's this other card that works well yes. with these two cards I have, which is very much how you want to approach drafting MH3, I think. But also, I've had those same experiences as you. Like, the form is just super well designed. There's been tons of, oh, I get to do this? Like, where you were like, you were already drafting an energy deck, but then like, all of a sudden, you get to do this other cool thing that you Mm -hmm. didn't even think you were going to do because the cards combine so well together. This format has been an absolute blast so far. If you haven't gotten a chance to draft it or play it yet, you need to be ready on Tuesday (laughs) on Arena. It is sweet. Yeah, yeah, I'm so pumped to get to podcast about this for a few months over the summer, pumped to get to to do a little RCQ event next weekend. Uh, So we've just got a ton of information to run through, a lot of cards to discuss, big picture stuff, check in on our assumptions from the crash course, all that good stuff. Before we get into the meat of the episode, let's do a little housekeeping. First things first is the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Lords of Limited is where folks can go to give back to the show if they so choose. The show will always be free, but we have some great perks over at the Patreon page. Even if you just want to give back, like you don't care about the perks. I and mean, I know that's a lot of folks, um, you know, because we've, we've done some surveys or whatever. I know a lot of people are just like, I don't really know what the reward tiers are over the Patreon. I just, <laughs> I just want to give back to the show. And honestly, love you folks. Love you folks for it. Um, so we do have some stuff for you. Access to the Lord's Limited Discord. Access to the episode a day early ad free. Access to our show notes to see it in written form. Get a little teaser before you hear it. And even access to monthly coaching sessions with me or Ben. So if any or all of that sounds of interest to you, head on over to the Patreon page. And we want to welcome our new patrons the first week that they join. And this week we're welcoming Michael, Jonathan, Joshua, Gnarly Batman, in Ray. Aged Monkey, Moss, Zachary, Cosmo Gaming, and Ben. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate your support. The Bens are just running up the score versus the Ethans. Oh, We're dominating. It's, yeah, it's not even like we can call the fight. It's you're, you, He's already dead, you know, like he's kicking him while he's down. <laughs> But seriously, cannot say thank you enough. Really appreciate everybody who joins the Patreon. And honestly, everybody who listens to the show, watches on YouTube, whatever. So engaging yeah. with the content supports the content. So we appreciate you all. Amen. All right. Tell me about early access. I My early access experience was a little different than yours. I was driving back from vacation. I was on vacation in Tybee Island. So I had my laptop and I downloaded the Dedication. VIP, <laughs> VIP Arena from my mobile hotspot, which took about an hour and a half. Oh, my God. And then, did two drafts. One time I disconnected during the draft and another time I disconnected during a match. So I played about like seven to eight games of magic, maybe maybe 10 games total of magic from two different drafts. It was a struggle for me during the uh, the arena early access. But yesterday I jammed a ton, played 10 hours straight of magic and felt absolutely gross afterwards. It was awesome. Yes, I love that. Just that little crusty feeling covered in Dorito dust and the stench <laughs> of Mountain Dew washing over you. Uh, yeah, so I had like I, I sort of got my sea legs a little bit in early access and I did both um, the arena one and the MTGO one, but definitely played more in, in the arena one. I didn't have much time yesterday for the MTGO one. Um, 
So it started off with, as as predicted, got into Eldrazi, drafted what ended up being a bad blue-green Eldrazi deck. And I'll talk about some of those cards as we, we get to them later, about like things that I think I thought might be good and weren't, etc. Then got into it, what ended up performing as a good black-white deck. Nothing special, just sort of like black-white nuts and bolts, kind of grindy, could be aggressive type deal. Was and it artifact-based or no? It was not really artifact based. I had an artifact based deck a little later on that was Mardu, but base black white, like splashing cranial ram and a couple other things. So it can do that. You were absolutely right about that. The black white can do that. And one of the reasons it can do that is it's signpost common is the one white black two, two with persist. And when it's modified, it has flying. The fact that that is an artifact creature and like goes late if you're like the only black white drafter at the table and mandibular kite is really good as the one mana uh it's not a one one flyer but effectively right it's living weapon grants a thing plus one plus one and flying has an equip cost for three and a white that being a one drop that's actually pretty good that gets your affinity train rolling those two cards at common i think are really what make black white artifacts viable so it just depends how much of those you get access to yeah you really in the heavy affinity decks like the ones that are trying to do the is it refurbished familiar is that what it's called the three and a black two one flyer yes um, when it etbs your opponent discards a card the ones that are trying to do multiple copies of that or like the true affinity thing you really want a one drop on turn yes one. your oh, starts yeah, are significantly sure. less explosive if you don't have a one drop artifact yeah one card that i found went pretty late i mean i think it was also sort of how the packs broke, but I when I ended up in artifact decks, I got multiple copies of Ethereum Terramander, which is the single black 1-1 one, one artifact at Uncommon. It has flying, can block only creatures with flying, and then it has six and a black adapt four, but that ability has affinity for other artifacts you control. That's something that like if no one else is interested in artifacts, which kind of it felt like no one was. I- I'm curious your thoughts about that deck. I didn't face artifact decks almost at all in any of my early access stuff and i felt like the deck was always it always felt kind of open so i wonder if we have a bit of a gumption situation on our hands where like you're gonna see something a little early that's like that is a good card for the artifacts deck and i'm just gonna go for it and if you build it they will come type deal with artifacts i'm not sure i think you could do that i don't love that idea of drafting the format i mean i certainly think you could and if it's open you're gonna get hooked up I, I, the thing i feel about the artifacts deck is you either want a premium version or you don't want to mess with it like the middle ground is a little murkier just because the eldrazi decks can go so big so fast that if mm-hmm. you aren't faster than them like you just lose to giant monsters but i think in, in the draft I would much rather, I think, try to read what's open, because if you do find what's open, you can get so hooked up. I I totally agree with you. But then I wonder, and I had this feeling, and I think other people did too, which is why I I never faced, you know, I played whatever 30-ish games of Magic on Wednesday and didn't, against different decks ostensibly, and did not face like a red-black artifacts deck, really. Maybe I did once, I don't know. But like, what I the feeling I felt was there wasn't really a hook into the deck a lot of the time. And then in pack two, I was I'm like, oh, these cranial rams are going late or these, you know, the two one flyers that make them discard are going late. And so I feel like you kind of have to get a, a step ahead of that if you want to get in the deck and just be like, I'm getting in it and then I'm holding on and I'm going to trust that it's going to be there. And I think it will. But, you know, we're it's early days. Who knows? Um, you probably do have to, I think, because there's not a premium card for the deck. No. that's going to like make you hold on. Yeah, and it, I think you do have to decide you're going to be drafting artifacts. Yeah. And I think a week ago we would have said Cranial Ram is that card. I don't think it is that card anymore. I, I just don't think that's like it's a good card, but I'm not seeing Cranial Ram and going Oh, snap, because I don't think the support is that great for Cranial Ram, unfortunately. Well, I, I played a, not even a premium red black artifacts deck. I was crazy impressed with Cranial Ram plus refurbished familiar, like being able to put the Ram on a flyer mm-hmm. was really strong. And, and I don't know, this is like a fairly off topic, but now seems like a good time to bring it up. Yeah, I, I've been feeling very strongly that either you want to be if you're trying to be aggressive, you either need to be attacking in the air mm. or you need to have trample like because the Eldrazi spawns just make life miserable. If you're yeah. trying to attack on the ground without 
trample. Like the the boards can get really clogged up. Your opponents have chump blockers for free or no cost. It's tough to mm-hmm. race if you don't have flyers or trample. Yeah. Um, and speaking of aggressive decks, the red white aggro deck that I drafted towards the end of my stream on Wednesday, I was crazy impressed by. We'll talk about a lot of the cards that overperform for me when we get to individual cards, but it played out much better than I expected. It, there's lots of, again, little synergies, landfall, energy stuff happening. Just a really cool deck. Um, the black green deck I talked about, like how I found the synergy overlap of Marionette Master or Marionette Apprentice rather with the Eldrazi spawn and just ramping Eldrazi ramping just seems really good to me so far. Um, even though the, the blue green Eldrazi deck that I drafted, I thought wasn't that good. I faced plenty that were fantastic. So I don't think that was more a, a user error than anything else. And I didn't really see much in the way of energy as sort of an inevitability engine until I played against you in our draft battle video yesterday. And you had a really sweet again. It was it was aggressive tempo, though, like it could do a later game thing. But you had a really sweet blue red energy deck. So I just think the format's kind of a playground right now, as far as I can tell. I agree. There's a lot of really cool stuff. I I do think there's things that are a cut above the rest. And I'm sure we will as you know, whatever, tens of thousands of people draft the format, we will figure that out more and more and more. But I I do agree if you find a good space like synergy space, whether that's energy or whether it's modified or whatever, if your cards or are working with your other cards and producing something that's more than some of their parts, you're going to be in good shape in the format, even if that's not like the, the tier one strategy. So speaking of what the tier one strategy is, how do you want to like sort of start to lay things out in the Ben Wernie rankings of everything so far? I mean, I think starting with color power rankings is good. Okay. I feel pretty strongly that red is number one. Okay. Um, Based on, I think it's versatility. And like, if we talk about draft avenues that you can take, I think Mm -hmm. red, all of red's color pairs are good. Red Black Artifacts is very good. Red Green Eldrazi. Is it? Yes. Red Black Artifacts is good. Okay. I Yes. I okay. feel pretty strongly that it's good. Okay. Uh, Red Green Eldrazi is nuts. Yes. I think one of the better archetypes in the format. I agree with that. Red Blue Energy is good. And I think Red White Aggro Beatdown is also very strong. Very good. Yes. That's, that's my feeling. So I think I'm happy being any of the red color pairs and also... Lots of reds commons do double duty. Yes. In, like multiple different wedges. So like it has powerful commons and it's also got very flexible commons. So I think starting there, I, like I don't know that you can always reliably just get deep into a color to like stay open and draft the way we normally would. But I do feel pretty strong that if you get deep into red, you'll be pretty flexible because the smelted charge bug one in a red, one three ETBs makes two energy and it's an artifact. It's got menace. Um, it's good in artifact synergy decks. It's good in basic aggressive decks like red, white. It mm-hmm. makes energy for your blue, red energy decks. It's an artifact for red, black. So the only place it's not really at home is red, green. So yeah. like th- that's a great but common. You can and it's play great it in three of the four archetypes. But red, green wants to slant aggressive. You can play it in red, green, but I agree that's where it's probably at its worst. But so that's why I think red's number one. Mm-hmm. I think green number two. Um, I've been very impressed with red green as a color pair. And again, green color pair is very happy with red green, very happy with green black. Mm-hmm. And I think blue green a, a little bit less um, and green white, I think is also awesome. So three of green's color pairs, again, very happy to be. I think green white's one of the again, one of the stronger archetypes in the format. Mm-hmm. So those two, I feel pretty confident are one and two. And then white, I would have in third right now, slightly ahead of black. Maybe I could see those flip flopping and then blue in last, mostly because the the blue archetypes just don't quite get there as much. The gold commons aren't as good. The gold uncommons aren't as good. Mm-hmm. I, I, and again, what we've seen in other formats, certainly room for blue to be awesome. I think the blue energy decks is a great way to play a controlling game plan. Blue black, great way to play a controlling game plan. But uh, opposite of red. Blue pulls you in a lot of different directions and there's not tons of overlap. Like basically blue is energy because the best common is tune the narrative. And so there's not like tons of ways to get out of the energy space once you're in blue. And not that that's a bad thing, but I think it just leaves you slightly less 
flexible during the draft because blue black is pretty disparate and you you can pull some of the draw three synergy into the energy control decks but basically i think if you're playing blue you're largely playing control or i guess there's the blue white tempo flyers thing i just haven't been impressed I with those commons i haven't or seen uncommons. it yet that's because yeah. they're not that good like there's not they're just blue just isn't doesn't as much really, of a reason does blue play blue can't really play an aggressive game it feels like i just don't know what blue is adding to that blue white mix I mean, en- energy production, I guess. But the the best energy decks I've seen are blue energy control decks. Yeah. Or, I mean, I I really like red, white aggro energy. But, like, it's hard. Energy, again, feels it's, it's less of an engine and more of a, like, an incremental snowball-y thing where you're like, I have, I affected the board in some way, and now I'm using this resource to press that advantage rather than how I used to think about energy, where it's like I assembled these things and over time I'm accruing value with this free stuff. You can do that. I think that's what blue red can do. But I also think assertive decks just take advantage of energy very well as well. Right. So the way the energy stuff has played out, speaking of energy, because we were talking about like bespoke battle wagon is the only way yeah. repeatedly. It's really, truly the only energy engine. That's the the three and a blue five, six vehicle that can tap to make two energy and tap to do a bunch of other stuff. You that's really good. That card is truly mm-hmm. excellent. But the energy cards are just if your deck is full of energy cards, you have an excess of energy to do cool things with energy. That has been my experience. Mm-hmm. If you if you put a bunch of energy cards in your deck, you've got enough energy to do the things you want. Yes, I agree. I, I want to jump ahead a little bit because you're talking about like, you know, w- what's making you think about colors being at the top of the power rankings or not and and how things are pulling you in different directions or have inherent synergy and i think it's worth chatting about this idea you have a little later about like getting deep into a color isn't necessarily good and like how what we might think staying open means in other formats doesn't necessarily mean that here yeah so for example like take these three green cards so we've got evolution witness which i think is the best green common card is great uh, two and a green for a two one common has one and a green adapt two, so you can put two plus one plus one counters on it if you pay that cost and whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on it return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand we called this garbage and greater garbage and then last week kind of walked it back and said we thought this card was no it's actually pretty good this card's great it's truly excellent and one of the reasons to be green one of the reasons to do plus one plus one counter synergies um, so take a start of that pack one pick one maybe into Eldrazi Repurposer, another great green common, two and a green for a 3-3 Devoid. When you cast it and when it dies, you make an Eldrazi spawn. And then Trickster's Elk, two and a green for a 3-3. It's got Bestow for one and a green. Enchanted Creature loses all abilities. And then a green Elk Creature with base power and toughness, 3-3. Like each one of these cards are kind of want to go into not necessarily disparate color pairs, but disparate spaces like the way i'm thinking about it in my head is a space like i'm either playing in the energy space or i'm playing in the modified space playing in an artifact space like trying to find mm-hmm. cards that will combine well into energy soup or modified soup or whatever and you could start with all three of these cards and think well i'm one color i'm super flexible but really you've got three different decks going on like eldrazi repurposer could help you go wide it could help you ramp Trickster's Elk's really a green, white, gold card and and is excellent in green, white. We talked about like not necessarily knowing the home for that. It's really good. Like the curve of the dog, the, the one green, the white, green, three, white, three, three, three vigilance. Yeah, yeah. that and then suiting Trickster's Elk on it and you get a six, six beating down on turn three. That's pretty oppressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Evolution Witness wants to do plus one, plus one counter things like it doesn't want to do modified. Like so you could say like well, evolution witness and tricksters up both want to do a modified right. thing, but not really like you have to dig deeper than modified or energy or whatever, because there's also a lot of like very specific sub synergies mm-hmm. in those big headliner mechanics. So a start like that, you could say, well, I'm in one color. I'm staying open. I don't think that's very good start compared to like thinking about maybe starting with an energy start. So something like tune the narrative, which is the blue instant draw card, make two energy into smelted charge bug, which is the one in red one three that we talked about. And then into an inspired inventor, which is the two in a white two, two, and then can either make a one, one three energy or put a plus almost one counter on something. All three of those cards want you to play in the energy space. Mm-hmm. And then you could, I think for me personally right now, I'd be hoping to be red, white followed by red, blue, 
followed by blue white. But I like I feel more on track and more open with a start of three cards of three different colors that want to play in the same synergy space Mm -hmm. than I do, for example, all three of those green cards that feel like pretty disparate starts. Yeah, no, that that all checks out to me. I think that's a really great way to think about the format and to think about what staying open means and what the start or what the beginning of drafts want to look like. Because as you pointed out, the rares are largely duds in this format. There's some powerful ones, but by and large, they're constructed plants. And as they should be, it's a Modern Horizon set. But a lot of those constructed plants aren't just raw power cards. They're, you know, cards that get powerful when you have four of them and specifically you're building a deck towards them. And we're just not really doing that. And so a lot of your starts are going to be with commons and uncommons. And you want to be thinking about what that space looks like rather than you're not just taking powerful card, powerful card, powerful card. I think synergy is going to already start to be a tiebreaker for you as early as pick two. Well, and I'm curious to see if you've experienced this. And I think a lot of listeners are going to experience this. When you open a pack, it's a bit overwhelming because Mm -hmm. you get you get hit in the face with, well, I see that card and that card's going to be good in modified. And I see this Mm -hmm. card and this card's going to be good in energy. And I see this card and this card goes great in an artifact deck. And you can see where all the cards go, but they go in very different places. And then let's say you settle on whichever one you think is the best. Pack one, pick one. And you take an energy card or whatever. And you get to pick two. And then you're hit with that same thing. of yeah. Like, well, there's this really good card that doesn't play well with my first pick. Is that enough better that I should take that and abandon my first pick? But there's also this other energy card and I could take that and do this energy thing. But then sometimes I've, I've drafted it a couple different ways. And I've been the happiest, I think, kind of trying to play in the same synergy space. As Mm -hmm. much as I could, unless the power level gap was huge, because once you get into like, well, I've got a couple energy cards and I've got a couple green white cards and I've got this good artifact card, you still have to make tough calls (laughs) like about which route you want to go down Mm -hmm. eventually has been my experience. Yeah, I I totally agree. I think it's really hard or it has been hard for me so far. And I'm sure once we play with cards more, once we have some, you know, 17 lands data that really shows us like, okay, this is like clearly doing well or clearly not doing well, whatever, like it's been hard to read signals and certainly hard to read signals again when it's day zero or day negative three. And I have a pick order in my mind and who knows what maybe other people are just reading cards for the first time. So a signal that I think something that I think is a signal may not actually be a signal, et cetera. But yes, I have found it hard to like know, okay, I'm pushing down this space. Is this actually open? Is this not? Does that matter? Sure. And I think one of the things that I've experienced, and I'm I'm curious to, I think this will be an awesome podcast episode if we can figure out the types of cards that let you do this. But the thing that's been hardest for me to do in draft is to like stay open to energy while also staying open to modified or like mm-hmm. finding a way to toe the line between the different synergy spaces of, of energy plus and plus one counters, artifacts, Eldrazi because they're so disparate but there are cards that I found a few that I really like that kind of play well in multiple of them and I think identifying those cards and figuring out how to stay open to multiple big synergy spaces a little deeper into the draft could be really cool as well but for right now I am I have found the best results trying to stick to a space okay I like it all right so if we get into archetype power rankings. And I think these are going to be informed a lot by what I think the best multicolor commons and the best multicolor uncommons are. So I just want to run through those real quick and see if you think anything's missing from the list or if you'd add anything. So best multicolor commons, I think, right? I think these are in no particular order, but I have been very impressed with this one. It might be number one. Uh, Writhing Chrysalis, two red green for the two three. And whenever you cast it, you make two Eldrazi spawn. It's got reach also, like as if it needed to have that. <laughs> And whenever you stack another Eldrazi, put a plus one plus one counter on Writhing Chrysalis. That card is absurd. Yes, I think Chrysalis is awesome. Okay, so if I were ranking, I think I would put that number one. I didn't really rank these. I think I would put number two, Faithful Watchdog, green, white for a zero zero Vigi. ETBs with three plus one plus one counters on it. I think starts with Faithful Watchdog from green, white decks are some of the most explosive starts you can have in the format. This, I'll, I'll defer to you. I have not seen green white decks and I haven't drafted them myself yet. So I will defer to you, but I, I buy it that, that it's busted. I've been very impressed. 
And then I think I, I don't feel confident between these last two, three or four, but been very impressed with both Conduit Goblin, Red White for the 2-2, two, two. ETBs, you get two energy. At the beginning of combat on a turn, you can pay an energy. If you do another target creature, you control gets plus one plus so and gains haste until end of turn. Yeah, I think I like Cranial Ram more than that, just because I think Conduit Goblin, like Cranial Ram feels like the crux of the red black deck in a way. And I don't think Conduit Goblin is very much okay. at all. Like it's yeah, good, so it's cr- good, but you don't need it in red white decks. You need Cranial Ram in red black decks. Yes. So Cranial Ram, I think, is, is the other one. Anything you would add to this list? No, I just the pulled up the, I just pulled up the list. I, I think have you seen like the blue black draw three is like sneaky snacker or anything that the recursive two on flyer? I watched Sirkovitz lose to LSV. Uh, he, I was watching but he, LSV like a, he had five of them in his deck, right? Yeah. I mean, it was imp- it was impressive. I mean, LSV just had some raw power. He had the stupid red white god or whatever the escape thing uh-huh. from Theros. Um, but I, I've played against blue black also once and sneaky snacker is really good. It's important. Okay. It's similar to cranial ram to the red black deck. I think it is that important to the blue black deck. The, the problem with blue black is like if I'm right about those being the two worst colors, like that's tough. Like, yeah, and that archetype is one that has the least bleed, I think. Right. Into like, other archetypes. So if you're if you if it's one of the worst and it has no outs to other archetypes, it's just going to be tough to draft unless like you're the one and nobody wants to do it. And then it, I do still think it gets there. Like if you get the sneaky snackers and you get all the stuff. Mm hmm. Yeah, but yeah, no, I, I don't see anything else that, that jumps out to me. And then multicolor uncommon wise, number one, Cursed Wombat, black green for a 2-3, uh, and it has two black green adapts two permanents you control have whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on this permanent, you get an additional plus one plus one counter on it. This ability triggers only once each turn. This means you get double triggers from yeah. all of your adapt things. I, I, you said you knew this already. I did not. I thought this was the same like replacement text that we'd seen before with these kinds of cards. Like, you know, so, but it's not like if you were to get two counters, instead you get three. It's no, you get two counters and then you get one counter, which means you double all the triggers of your plus one plus one counter matters stuff. So evolution witness is now it's getting two, two hard, things back the when you I adapt it. This is so dumb. <laughs> which is just wild. Like, I had the stupid, I don't even know what it's called. It's like a five mana, four, four. It has two and a black, adapt two. And when counters are put on it, you can pay two life. And if you do draw two, I had that as like filler in this black green deck and adapted it with Wombat in play. And then two triggers came up. And so I got to pay four, draw four. And I was blown away by how good that was. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea that that was what was coming for me. It's insane. Cursed Wombat is the best one, I think. But you are very high on Titans Vanguard, and I think I'm I'm willing to co-sign. I've seen it a few more times I, since we talked. I'm also uh, I'm I'm possibly in the camp of Titans Vanguard as number one, and I love Cursed Wombat. Okay, I'm and I, I've seen it and I've been impressed. Titans Vanguard three red green for a five five devoid. When you cast it and whenever it attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on each colorless creature you control, and it has trample. I just need I need to reread that because we got to really stress like, when you cast this spell and when you attack. So this is Ridge Scale Tusker. It is a five mana five five. And you're going to if you're in, in red green, you're going to have devoid stuff and you're going to have a bunch of spawn. So this is like five mana for, you know, let's say eight. Let's say conservatively eight, eight power and toughness on cast. And then if this isn't killed on sight, it's attacking as a 6-6, six, six, and then everything else gets another counter. Like, if this attacks, I don't know how you win. All right, I don't, well, I don't like, you could be playing an opponent against an opponent with a bespoke battle wagon who, who chooses to, <laughs> to attack with your Titans Vanguard. That's true. Uh, Spoilers yes. for our showdown video. That's right, that's right. But yeah, I think this card is going to put up stats on uh, 17 lands for sure. You'll love to see it. Next, we've got Golden Tail Trainer. This is one green white for a 1-3. Uh, this first line of text I thought was kind of flavor text, but I think this is actually the juice of the card. Mm. Or, or in equipment spells you cast cost X less to cast, where X is Golden Tail Trainer's power. And whenever it attacks, other modified creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is Golden Tail Trainer's power. I mean, that part is also awesome. But the thing that's unapparent, like I thought this card was garbage when I was evaluating it. The thing mm. that's not apparent is how explosive it is mana-wise. So like the turn that you pump its power... Oftentimes you can bestow like 
something for a single white mana, and then maybe you drop a Colossal Dread Mask for green, green. Like, it just gives you so much mana if you can get its power up to three or four or something like that. And then you dump all this modified stuff onto the battlefield, and then the following turn when you swing, it's just lights out. But your opponent by that time has so much stuff to deal with. Like, you've just vomited so much power and toughness onto the battlefield if you build your deck right in a streamlined green-white deck that I think this card's really impressive. Yeah, again, much like the dog, I haven't haven't seen it on the other side or on my own side of the battlefield, but what you're describing sounds awesome. And then lastly, we've got Scurry of Gremlins here, two red-white for the enchantment. ETBs, you make two 1-1 one, one red gremlin creature tokens, and you can pay four energy to give creatures you control plus one plus O oh, and haste until end of turn. This is a bit of a hammer, like it just comes down and it's a lot of damage surprise, especially because there's other stuff in red white that really supports this go wide theme. And so they can often be attacking not just as as two ones, but maybe three ones or you're pumping. You know, it's just it, it's a lot of damage. The one card you don't have on this list that I do want to shout out and I could I think might possibly could be better than scurry. I don't know. I have been very impressed by Wastescape Battle Mage. This is the one colorless two two as kicker for Green and or one and a blue. If it's green kicker cost is paid, you exile an artifact or enchantment and opponent controls. And if it's blue kicker cost is paid, you return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. Having casted myself, had a cast against me a lot, and it was very good every time it was cast. I buy it. I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. So the thing I'm noticing there is the overlap. Like, and I'm and the the overlap of two cards I'm really high on, two cards that might be at the top of the list is Writhing Chrysalis, the red green common, and Titan's Vanguard, the red green uncommon. Like red green aggro just seems priced to move. Yeah, those two could be number one for right? I think for, for both lists. Yeah, that's pretty wild, which is kind of absurd. And then green white's got the overlap too. Red white also has the overlap. And the other thing that you'll notice is there's a giant absence of blue, blue. cards in those and two bla- lists and black cards. There's one yeah, cr- cranial ram. That's it. There's cranial ram. There's cursed wombat too. Yeah, Chris sure, Wombat sure, sure. Is, is pretty nuts. Yeah, but I think that's a lot of that's informing my color rankings and my my archetype rankings, as well as playing with a bunch of the other cars, the commons and all the other stuff we've talked about. But so that leads me to like kind of two archetype tiers, may, maybe three, like maybe it's red, green, green, white, red, white, a cut above the rest. But certainly those three are in tier one, along with blue, red, red, black and green, black. I think those would be that's... the top six archetypes for me. Yeah, I think if we're, I think I would split these into three tiers and I would say Naya is in tier one and then I'd put those three in tier two. I'm just not sold like may and maybe I, and I might actually put green black in number one off the back of of Wombat and the cross synergies that exist. I'm still not sold on. I feel like red black is a little too like even if all the pieces come together, you're getting a tier one point five deck. I just have to respectfully disagree at the moment, I think. But okay. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure time will tell. Sure. And I'm sure I'm sure the listeners will let us know who is right. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, and then like the bottom tier would be blue, black, blue, green, blue, white, and then white, black. That's a bad. Bad look for blue. It's a bad if look that, for blue. And right. again, willing to be wrong. But I also don't think blue is unplayable. Like it's not remotely close to that kind of a situation. No, not remotely close. No, I just think it it, what really one. And again, I don't know if any of this matters. Like one, it's commons leave a lot to be desired in my mind. And two, it's cards pull you in vast. There's not that inherent synergy that red has. There's not that raw power that some of the colors have that maybe white has. But like blue is like you take this card, it's doing this. You take this card, it's doing that. And I guess what you're thinking is that it's just you want to focus on energy if you're in blue. Yeah, because tunes nuts. Like yeah. that's the reason. Like so, if you get into blue, you're getting into blue for tunes. And if you if you're picking tunes, you have to play energy. Like you <laughs> just have to play in the energy space. But I just think like, I think we got to shift how. And this is a, a broader, bigger conversation to have. I do think we have to shift how we're thinking about commons with play boosters, because they're just in, not, in what sense? In the sense of like centering the limited conversation around them. Yeah, I think I think uncommons have to be. At the level, I think we need maybe need to just talk about them as a group of non rares, or I think uncommons the sh- the focus shifts to uncommons because I don't think gone are the days where your deck is like fourteen commons, you know, seven uncommons and a few rares. It's not that anymore, and so we don't need to be like, well, what are the commons giving us? It's like 
the commons are giving you removal and some like you know role player cards but your focus is on uncommons that's fair. I mean, I'd buy it. And that's that's why I wanted to take a look at the best multicolor commons and the best multicolor yeah. uncommons. I think that might be a way going down the road. Once you play with the cards initially to figure out what you think the premium archetypes are, maybe the most reliable way, because that's what I've found the last few sets is the colors that get the juiced multicolor cards. Yes. Are just the best archetypes because those cards are so good that then they pull up all the other cards around them because you want to try to get into those archetypes so much. Yeah, for sure. All right. So just we've been talking about general draft strategy, but just to throw throw more things out there and see if anything sticks for our listeners. This format's highly synergistic, way more so even than I would have thought from studying the previews or, you know, it's master set. It's going to be synergistic. Like the amount of times I've thought, oh, I didn't know I got to do that. Yes. Like, it's just been like... <laughs> way 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 more the last time i felt like this i think as far as like synapses firing and like getting endorphins from like cool things happening was icoria like when you're mutating and you get the mutate uh -huh. stacks of like all these triggers there's just there's just a lot going on in the mm -hmm. format and i think in that line powerful synergy way trumps individual power because there just isn't a lot of individual power. That's the other thing. That's the other reason I agree with this is that not only do I think that's true just in a in a intrinsic sense, but there's a lot more powerful synergy to be had than there is intrinsic power. Yes. But I think if you if any Paul's running around, really. Right. Yes. You're not losing to one card. You're losing to a combination of three cards. If you're Correct. losing your opponent drafted well, generally. Yeah. Uh, so take something like Skoa Ember Mage. This was something we talked about last week. Like, is this good? Is this not good? We don't know. Could be powerful. It's four red red for a four four ETBs deal four damage to any target. And then it has grandeur. You can discard another card named Skoa Ember Mage. Sacrifice two mountains to have it deal four damage to any target. I basically, I think at this point, would hope to never have Skoa Ember Mage in my deck. I don't know. Just, just Lola Men just bombed me out for eight in a game where I that I was handily gonna win, and then he just went Ember Mage. You discard Ember Mage, and I was at seven. Oh, <laughs> no. So I don't know, but yes, I, I think I agree with you largely that this is not. It's hard for me to imagine a draft where I'm happy running this or multiple of this. So compare that to Molten Gatekeeper. Oh, this baby, is a, a huge shift for me mentally. Uh, Molten Gatekeepers, two and a red for a two, three. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals one damage each opponent and it's got unearth for a red. If you had asked me prior to playing in these early access events, which was better, I would have told you I thought Skoa Ember Mage probably and that I only thought Molten Gatekeeper would be good in artifacts like filler in artifacts. Yeah, but this is like a card you'd have to play to get your artifact count right. high enough. But this is the type of card that's got tons and tons and tons of cross synergy that's not immediately apparent and i've seen it from some opponents but really you're the person that that turned me on to this card there's this like jund space of go wide tokens that cares about etb with molten gatekeeper and cares about them dying with marionette apprentice and then green is just flooding you with all of these spawn tokens but also gatekeeper goes well in red white which is go wide and gatekeeper is also playing well as we said in red black right so it's playing well in two go wide spaces with the ETBs and playing well with its types. And then like unearth is a thing there. It's just like it's doing so many little things. It's really desirable. Yeah, completely agree with all that. And another card I play with a lot more since since you and I talked yesterday when we did our, our draft showdown. A card that's really impressed me that kind of ties the rim together in that space really well. It's glimpse the impossible. The, the two in a red sorcery. Exile the oh. top three cards of your library, and then cards you don't use, you make three spawn. So uh -huh. like it's a combo card in the sense of if you want, you can choose to use none of them, get three spawn, sack three spawn. Like that's really cool. If, assuming you do the marionette apprentice thing, like the ETB and the leave leave the battlefield thing, but also just like does a surprising amount of stuff. I I, I think glimpse the impossible is a pretty cool card. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen that very much, and I've played it myself, but I buy it. Like. That's the type of thing where you just go, oh, these actually are all kind of cooking together. I had a thing with Propagator Drone, which is the one in a green 2-2, two, two, uncommon. It gives creature tokens you control evolve. And I had that in one of my like green, black, jundy soup decks with the Wombat. And I was like, well, this is going to double my evolve. Like, it's going to double the counters <laughs> with evolve triggers. And like, that's just the kind of like little stuff that I would never have, never have seen during like whatever the crash course and only 
as I'm starting to cook in the drafts, am I starting to see? And I just think we're scratching the surface. That's why you need to do those practice drafts, baby. Got, got me. Em. You got me. You got me. <laughs> but yeah, that card that gives your your tokens evolve is totally broken. It's yeah. very, very, very good. Yep. Well, because a thing that I missed, and someone pointed out this out to us after the crash course, is that a lot of the things that make spawns are on cast. And so the spawns are coming in first, and then the creature that made the spawn is coming in, and then they're going to evolve, right? You play the 3-3, the common 3-3 that makes a spawn, and that's coming in afterwards, and so then it's going to immediately evolve. It's crazy. The other annoying thing about those being on cast is that it makes <laughs> the, the counter spell, the energy counter spell, way worse. Another thing that Ben learned in our match yesterday. Okay, so we, we've talked a bit about these synergy spaces as kind of ways to think about drafting. I do think each color has a synergy space or spaces they want to lean towards. So I think as you're like starting to get into a color maybe or a synergy space, like thinking about where it overlaps or where you could pivot off to. We talked about red playing well in a bunch of different areas. It's got energy. It's got artifacts. It's got Eldrazi. It's got go white aggro. Like it's, it's the total package. And I think a lot of its cards have a ton of bleed there. So I think you're pretty happy playing any color pair when you're red. Mm -hmm. If you're green, I think first you want to be doing plus one, plus one counter shenanigans in, in green, black or green, white, secondarily, specifically modified. Mm, but I think okay. plus one, plus one counters even more than modified. Yeah. Because modified is more of a green, white thing than it is a green, right. black thing. But both of them are plus one, plus one counters. And then secondarily, doing Eldrazi. Yeah. And, and maybe that's primary if we think red green is the best deck. But those two things. Yeah, I certainly want to be doing Eldrazi more than modified with green, but that's just my sick brain. Well, and I think if red green's the best deck, it probably will flip up. But and again, this is maybe back to your shift in limited. I think it's commons want to do the plus one plus one counter thing just because evolution witness is so strong. But yeah, but uh, see, but I I think the the stupid the three three that makes spawns on ETB and dies is better. Like I know you don't think that right now, but like I, I think time will tell. I'm not super confident. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm not. I'm not like hard and fast. It's evolution witness for sure. I, I'm not super confident about the order of the green commons. I do agree; those are two of the best. And then pairing it, I think with green, you're hoping to pair with red first. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I guess that is backwards. Maybe I do want to be me Eldrazi because I think red green's the best deck. Yes, uh, of them. So red first and then white, and then black. But I think you're hoping to avoid pairing green with blue when you start green. Which is weird, because I have, but I've liked, I've seen good green-blue ramp decks, but I just feel like it's largely green, and that's largely green doing Eldrazi stuff, and blue's just probably bringing stuff from higher rarity there. Yeah. And then black, I think if you're, if you're starting black, you want to do something with artifacts primarily, and then maybe secondarily modified stuff, but pa pairs best with red and green. So if you're black, you're probably in the Jun space. Yeah, and I think I hoping to, hoping to be black red more than black green, at least for me. Mm -hmm. But I think the Mardu space is also fine for black. Yes, but that would be artifacts. Yes, I think yes. like so talking about the synergies you're going to pair it with. You're yeah, primarily yeah. going to pair it with artifact synergies. Yes. Maybe secondarily going to pair it with modified synergies. If you're blue. I think you almost have to play in the energy space, which mm -hmm. is weird. Um, but hoping to pair it with red or white. And then secondarily, like it can do the Eldrazi thing. Mm -hmm. And then if you're white, I think you really want to be aggressive. I think you primarily want to do plus one, plus one counters, modified things, maybe some energy stuff in red, white. And then lastly, kind of artifacts. But similar to red, white gets to play in a lot of different spaces, just with always an aggressive focus, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think just having having the concept of synergy spaces in your head as you're drafting, I think can really help inform some of that overwhelming nature of the packs of like rather than thinking about, OK, I got to figure out if I'm red, black or I got to figure out if I'm green, white. And I mean, you should ultimately be trying to hone in on that, but like starting big and then honing your way in during the draft is I think the, the best way I've found to approach it so far. Yeah. Well, and you're talking about this in terms of color pairs, which is right, but I have found, and we really haven't even chatted about this yet, that the, the fixing and the lands specifically with the fetch lands and the MDFCs 
allows you to get in the three color space fairly easily. And I'm not talking about like full three color soup, but I am talking about like being black, white and feeling fine about splashing cranial rams and feeling like you can cast them on turn two even, you know, like I do think that the fixing is there and these lands, the fetch lands specifically are very powerful picks. And we're talking about what you get at common. The fetch lands are, are top of the heap for me in terms of what I'm looking at at the common level. Yeah, the fetch lands are incredible. And I think a huge part of the format, just in terms of power level, in terms of splashing. And to be clear, a lot of these decks are going to be base two colors. Correct. Splashing a third color, because that's just how the synergy works in the format. Right. And so I I do want to chat about the lands real quick. So first of all, the reason the fetch lands are so impressive to me. So what they do is obviously they enable splashing, right? You put, they, they, they give you, they're sort of, they're an evolving wilds if you're splashing responsibly. If they hit your three colors, that's amazing. That's literally evolving wilds. If they hit two of your three colors, that's pretty good too. But they also enable colorless splashing. And so like there are, there's a cycle of like one color pip colorless rares right a one colorless red three three devoid trample rare that's pretty nuts there's there's a cycle of these cards you're gonna want access to colorless lands in basically any deck that's doing eldrazi stuff for sure and so uncracked fetches give you access to that right and so then there's also this nice sequencing of am i do i want to crack this whatever the fact that your evolving wilds can tap for mana the turn you play it is also Broken. great. It's, it's insanely powerful. There's a, there's, there's a non-zero amount of landfall triggers in the format, and they give you double landfall triggers. They enable cards that care about you sacrificing non-token permanence, which I learned about yesterday <laughs> live on air. They give you shuffle stuff, or right, your brain surge card, the three, the two and a blue, draw four, then put two back, and then you get to shuffle those two away. And on top of that, there's this nice little small text at the bottom that says you could sometimes even cycle them to draw a card. That doesn't come up very often, I've found, but I have cycled a few lands, and that's also awesome. These fetch lands, like, they just do so, 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 so much. I think that was the biggest difference between the Arena Early Access and the MTGO Early Access to me was I I came in thinking the fetch lands were going to be very high picks, and on Arena, I... I basically ended up with as many of them as I wanted. Like one mm-hmm. time I had like 11 fetches. I played a deck with 11 fetches and six basics. Like a five God. color deck was one of my two, my two arena early access drafts. And on MTGO, I felt like I had to spend some real picks on them or mm. be in the right wedge. And then maybe I would get some of the ones that touch my wedge a little later. Yeah. That people weren't quite as interested in, but I felt like they were a higher premium in the drafts on MTGO. Yeah, I think the fetch lines are great. And I do just want to chat about MDFCs and sort of a, a way to think about them. One thing I was surprised by was that, you know, if you're just playing like, let's say you're in white black and you're playing the like red white trick um, MDFC, the one that gives your thing double power and first strike. And you just, that's in your opener and you play that as your ETB tapped land. And then a little bit down the road, you might find, oh, now I have this free red source in my white black deck and I can cycle my Mardu fetch land that I didn't think I was going to be able to. So those MDFCs unlocking that ability a little later on in the game was a surprise to me. I was really impressed by the situationally powerful ones, like way more than sort of the random, whatever stump stomp, the like bite spell, fight spell, whatever, like the ones that are really like, like even that one I just talked about the double, the power first strike trick or the, the green white aura that gives the thing plus one plus one for all the creatures and enchantments you have. Like, these situational things where you wouldn't ever put that card alone in your deck, but then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't need a land, but I do love putting plus five, plus five on a creature right now. Like, they're really good. I do think picking them around C plus is still right. I do think some of them are in the B minus territory, probably. Some of them are a little whatever in the C, C minus territory, but they're all in that space. And then how to think about them in terms of mana base. My philosophy is, They always replace lands one to one. If you only have one, it's probably fine to just still have 17 lands as your land count. If you have two to three, I would bump your land count up to 18. So if you have two MDFCs, then you have 16 basics or 16 
you know, non spell lands. If you have four to five MDFCs, bump your land count up to 19 lands. And if you have six or more, your land count is 20 lands. And I would never go below like, I don't know, 12 untapped sources. This is probably saying you probably never want to go below 14 untapped 14, sources. Yeah. Um, and I think getting six plus is probably just a rarity. Um, but that's how I think about them is, is just you up your total land count in the deck, but then think about them as lands first and foremost. Right. And so the duels, I think, are almost better in some senses than the ones that come in untapped to pay three life because they help with the splashing stuff. Two, they're cards you can take early that you know are going to be good that are maybe touching like maybe you start the draft with a couple red cards and then you take a red white duel and you know no matter what you can play that as a mountain in your deck that's Mm -hmm. also a spell but then also can help with splashing i think they are uh, uh, other ways to potentially delay the decision um i agree i've been i've been very impressed with them i absolutely stole a game with the one that doubles power yeah and gives first strike i had a furnace dragon i had domed my opponent for 19 (laughs) it was awesome (laughs) <laughs> that is hot. That is hot. Um, all right, we have a, a big list of cards to chat about real quick. Um, not real quick, probably. Real as much time as it takes us. First up is Reckless Pyro Surfer. One in a red for an uncommon. It's a 2-2 two, two with haste and has landfall. Whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, it gains battle cry until end of turn, and battle cry means when it attacks. Each other attacking creature gets plus one plus oh until end of turn, and you can get multiple instances of battle cry on this with your fetch lands. This is a premium pickup. Certainly, this, this might be a red-white go-wide card, except it's also ridiculously good in red-green with Eldrazi spawns. Yeah, so like, it's definitely red-green, too. This is just a really, really good aggro card. And I think in red green, you're more likely to be splashing and have the fetches than you are in red white, but it's, it's excellent in both decks. Mm-hmm. But the thing about like the thing I was noticing when I was because I drafted a lot of like low curve aggro decks with a bunch of one drops. And I'm always I always think to myself, I don't want a lot of tap lands when I'm playing a bunch of one like color required one drops. I just didn't care. Like I, I didn't care about having my colorless lands. It, it, you know, in terms of the fetch lands being colorless lands until you crack them. Like I played a red white aggro deck with like I think five or six fetch lands, partially be- so I could get a lot of the I had double pyro surfer and wanted to get a lot of landfall triggers. I think it just doesn't matter. No. Next up, smelted charge bug. We can't sing this card's praises enough. Yeah, uh, one in red, one three menace. The little bug that could when it ETBs you get two energy, and whenever it attacks you can pay an energy. If you do, another target attacking creature gets plus one plus zero oh and gains menace until end of turn. Not only is this synergistically at the intersection of artifacts, energy, aggro, like all of those different spaces. The other thing that it does that's not apparent on the card is it it basically forces your opponent to race because it makes their life absolutely miserable for defense because they don't know whether or not you're going to pay the energy when they're leaving back blockers. Plus, you could have removal and a a card like that that's two mana that's that synergistic that also forces your opponent to play the game a certain way somehow has keyword bad on it (laughs) (laughs) it's also somehow something where you're like well i'm not gonna kill that not not me i am (laughs) snapping off my galvanic blast or whatever the card's called but then they're but then they're left with two energy which is also great like yeah charge bug is awesome i want to shout out nesting grounds this is the land taps for colorless and then you can pay one tap move a counter from target permanent you control onto another target permanent activate only as a sorcery so I, this card just like we already had our eyes on this it's great with the wombat right you move a counter from something onto something else and now boom gets two counters instead um double the the counter matter synergy etc but something i discovered with obstinate gargoyle the one white black two two common that has persist is that you can move the minus one, minus one counter off your gargoyle onto your opponent's creatures, which is I did that last night after you told me about this combo. It was so fun. It feels filthy. It's so grindy. (laughs) Yeah. Right, because then they're just like, they can't kill it. And if you have a sack outlet for it, like, it's just, it's delicious. The other thing I realized with Nesting Grounds is that it's sick with sagas. You can, you can, you can leave your sagas on a chapter like so a Johnny fells the God sire or whatever you can ETB exile something move the counter and then you can move the counter off and then your next upkeep you get to exile another thing like you can just you can like stick sagas on whatever chapter they're on which is really cool pretty awesome and I know it's not good but if your deck is like really hard on the nesting ground synergy that 
that three and a black three two menace like you have to lose three life but you can tutor up stuff equal to your devotion to black Ooh. and just search up nesting grounds i love it yeah this format's so good <laughs> there's the thing like there's this format's gonna be it's gonna be a couple things like you're just gonna be able to draft the format like if you just sit down and you're like i'm gonna draft energy and you draft energy you're probably gonna get a functional deck that's that's pretty good yeah but the other thing that the format's gonna do is it's gonna reward depth of knowledge mm-hmm. so heavily yeah. during the drafts. Yep, for sure. Um, I, I want to shout out Worm Coil Larva as I think an underperformer. Ooh, three black black, three three death touch lifelinks. When it dies, it splits into a, a one two with death touch and a two one with lifelink. I think this card is basically only good if you're defensive and so like it's awkward that I don't think it's that good in the artifact deck. I think if you're like black green grindy, it's like fine. But then you often you're, you're going to have stuff to do that's big mana and maybe you want them to be Eldrazi. I don't know. I have not been that impressed by it. And I think your shout that Dreadmobile is a better black uncommon than this is absolutely right. I think Wormcore Larva is back to the point of power versus synergy. Wormcore Larva is a very intrinsically powerful card that's not that synergistic and- in the format. And the and thing five mana for something like that is not not great. And the other thing about it is like your your point about, you know, you want to win in the air if you're aggressive. But then also like with Eldrazi spawn existing and not that you can chump sack. Yeah, you can chump sack so they don't gain life. And not to say that isn't a cost. Like I have not. I've played a lot of Eldrazi spawn and I want to use them. I want to use them to ramp. I want to like, you know, use them for whatever. Like I, I don't often it is a cost to think about them as chump sackers. But like you can do it for sure. Yes. Uh, utter insignificance. Have you seen this card in play? I have, but very infrequently. I think this card's good. This is the one in blue Ooh. flash and chain creature. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board. This is the like flash and chant creature. It become, lose all abilities, base power and toughness one one, and then two and a colorless exile enchanted creature. One of the things I was really impressed by with this is it in conjunction with uh, evolution witness that this is a recurrable removal spell for you. Um, and just the fact that this, it, it does, it has got that dreadful apathy thing of like, you know, get the thing kind of dead and then you can really get it dead a little later on. Um, it's a combat trick. I think this is just good. Next up, we've got Marionette Apprentice. I, it's impossible to sing this card's praises enough. The The, the issue I'm going to run into with MH3 is that I have pet cards already. Yeah. <laughs> and like yep. Marionette Apprentice is one of them. And I could be like, I could be drafting energy and I see a Marionette Apprentice and I'm like, oh, I really want to play with that Marionette yeah. Apprentice. Like, and it's probably not right to pick it, but I do it anyway and then train back myself. But this card's great. It's great in green black. It's great in red black. It's good in black white. There's the thing that's really sick with black is there's also several rares plus the Dreadmobile that give you free or very cheap sacrifice outlets that mm-hmm. actually turns on red black sacrifice as mm-hmm. an archetype as well or or green black sacrifice but there's there's definitely sacrifice decks there's red black steel and sack that you can do it takes some higher rarity cards but that's also awesome yeah for sure uh we chatted about cursed wombat uh, this is gonna be i think the first card we're a little different on uh serum visionary two and a blue two two common when etbs draw a card then scry two I was impressed by this. I haven't played this a bunch myself, but every time my opponent cast it, I was like, it's kind of annoying. I think this might like, so what we were saying before was like, this doesn't feel like it has a home anywhere, but I think the reverse but is maybe that it its has, home is everywhere. <laughs> that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like it doesn't really, it doesn't have any synergy really other than like maybe with in conjunction with something else for the draw three on your turn in blue black. But I think it's like just good. I think it's just a good card. I'm going to push back and disagree. I I think I haven't been impressed. And I think every time my opponents played Serum Visionary, I've thought, Ah. what did you do? (laughs) Okay. Okay. I'm I'm pretty happy every time my opponent, not not happy, but I have not felt poorly Mm -hmm. when I've played Serum Visionaries. Uh, Next, we've got Sage of the Unknowable. One in a green for an 0-4. Taps for Colos. Spend the mana only to cast Colos spell or to activate an ability. This card's not great, right? Yeah, it's one in a blue also, not one in a green. But yeah, this card's not great. I thought this would be good in blue-green, Eldrazi, Ramp, whatever. Like, this card's just not good. It's a pretty pretty big dud, I think. And p- part of why, like, I'm just sort of like, what, Blue, what are you, Blue, what are you doing? 
Talk to me about the next one. This is Malevolent Rumble. Yeah. Honor Green for a sorcery. Reveal the top four of your library. You can put a permanent card from among them in your hand. Put the rest into your graveyard and then make an Eldrazi spawn a token. You're pretty high on this card. I think I've come up on it, but I still, I haven't seen it enough to really know. I mean, you saw it in my black green deck. I had three copies of it in that deck. Like, so here, here's this, and it might be a little confirmation bias because like I wanted this card to be good. I had it in my top three green commons. I've liked it so far. You did it, those practice drafts, baby. Did those practice drafts. <laughs> I think that um, it might be like just a black green gold card because that's really where you're getting all the the pieces of the buffalo to borrow from previous formats. Like you're getting... The card selection, you're getting the 01 that you're going to use either to ramp or you're going to care about a body to sacrifice. You're going to care about Aldrazi, but you're also going to get the three cards in your graveyard. And so, like, let's say you've got the, what is it, Eviscerator's Insight or whatever, the, like, one and a black sack of thing, draw two, and has flashback for four and a black. You've been a card with flashback. You've been your Wither and Bloom, and now you've just got this free plus and plus one counter coming around a little later. Like, I think this card just really... It's it's synergy possibilities are really high, and that's a lot for two mana, little bit of card selection, plus a piece of cardboard. I, I like this this card a lot. I think the other places really at home is in the Eldrazi space also, right? To just yeah. dig you towards either your build around enchantments or your really good haymakers. Mm-hmm. Because those decks are ramping and you want to make sure after you're done ramping that you get to slam the haymaker. I think right, that's I th- the other place. And I do. think you would still play this even in, I think you're less excited about it in green, red aggro, but depending on the pieces you want to find, like just playing this, finding a writhing chrysalis and playing chrysalis on three. Chrysalis on three is so unfair. That's so <laughs> chrysalis good. On three is so unfair. <laughs> and, and malevolent rumbler like lets you do that just a little bit more consistently. And that's really strong. The other thing that's been the the best curves, the most tilting curves <laughs> I played against from Red Green last night, because I haven't gotten to do this yet, is when you curve Chrysalis on three into one of the six drops that have Annihilator one on four. Oh, God. And then like then the rest then of the you're time just like you're having to like sacrifice vice. a resource. You're just you're just like trying so hard to keep your head above water <laughs> and, and like it's not enough that you just concede, but like in my experience, it's really hard to overcome. So you just like slowly drown to Annihilator yeah. 1. It feels horrible. Yep, I have died. I had an opponent ramp out the the Null Drifter against me during early access. And I was like, how bad could Annihilator 1 be? Whatever. It's, it's really bad. On turn 5, it's really bad. It's actually really it's, bad. It's really bad. <laughs> even if you have, like, this is what I think I even had some Eldrazi spawn. And I was like, oh, I'll sack a spawn. And then I'll, I'll sack this land or whatever. It's just like, nah, you're just in a vice. You're just done. Yeah, that was, that was the thing. Like, I was an artifact synergy deck. So I had, like, I had stuff laying around. And it was still <laughs> yeah. so hard to fight through. <laughs> Uh, next up is Proud Pack Rhino, two and a white, three, three. When an ETBs choose one, put a shield counter on target permanent or proliferate. This card, I think, is really good. Shield counters are dumb, and there's ways to get around it, like Wither and Bloom. Like, if you put the shield counter on this, you can Wither and Bloom to answer it. There's enchantment removal spells to, to answer it, but, like, you are you also can get two for one to buy it a lot of the time. Yeah, Proud Pack Rhino is very strong. Depth Defiler up next. I kept... I'm thinking this, my opponents were cheating against me with this card. <laughs> I was bugged until Twitch chat explained it to me. It's three blue blue for a three five at uncommon with devoid. Has kicker of a colorless. And it says whenever you cast this spell, choose one. If it was kicked, choose both instead. I Did thought you, you had to kick it to get to one get of the one? two effects. No. And I kept, I kept thinking like, why, why are my opponents cheating? They're only spending five mana. They're still getting this thing. Like they should at least spend the other mana. But no, you just get one of the effects. Yeah. And if you kick it, you get both. So you can either bounce something or have target player draw two cards and discard a card. This card is nuts. Yeah, this card is really, really strong. I also agree. Uh, let's check in about Kozilek's Unsealing. Two and a blue, devoid enchantment. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value four, five, or six, you get two spawn. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value seven or greater, draw three cards. This was in my, I think this was like maybe my pack one pick two of my first draft. And I was like, all right, let's cool. Let's let's try and build around this and got what I thought was a yeah, ended up being not a great blue green Eldrazi deck. But one of the things that's hard about this is what you really want a lot of the time is to spawn. And what is the easiest to get your hands on is stuff that has MV7. Because like 
the common cyclers have MV7, you know? And like, it's just awkward because you're like, what I really want is more spawn so I can d- chain my big spells together or whatever, or have some chump fodder as I'm trying to like stabilize with my big stuff. I don't need to draw three multiple times in a game of magic. Like, because I might just die without the resources to do it. So I do think there's a bit of like uh, drafting and deck building considerations for this beyond just like build around. Do you still think it's good? I haven't gotten to play with it yet and I haven't seen it on the battlefield, but based on what I've done in the format, I'm still pretty high on it and I still want to try it out. I think it's very strong. I think I I did not build around it correctly. I faced Jason Yi, who drafted a nutso deck with a bunch of, I'm, they also had a bunch of really good rares, but they had Kozilek's on ceiling and it was doing work. So I do think it's still good. I just think like, it's not just like, you just want to think about the mana value of the things you're drafting when you take it. Yeah. All right, that takes us on to tune the narrative. The top blue common, blue instant, gets you energy, draw a card, instant speed. Energy is broken. Free energy is broken. Tune the narrative is very good. So you're on board uh, with this as top blue common, yeah? Yeah, because I, I think also that's the other tension with blue is deem the inferior, I think, or deem inferior, whatever it's called. The three mm-hmm. blue put something back and then it costs less for each card you drew. That That, that only really wants to be in blue black. Like it's great. If you're consistently drawing three, but otherwise it's it's fine. Yeah. Takes us uh, on yeah. to Nyxborn Hydra, which is, I think, not a super high pick, but it's a great fireball or mana sink for the big mana decks. This is green X for an O1, reach trample, ETBs with X plus one plus one counters on it, and you can bestow it for green green X. And the enchanted creature then gets plus one plus one and trample for each plus one plus one counter on Nyxborn Hydra. This I think is I think you want one. In the green big mana decks, maybe, like maybe two. What depending is the on what big? Your what like. green big mana decks are you talking about? Like just green, ones green, that blue? Like if you're ramping, you've got some Eldrazi spawn laying around. Like giving something trample and making it bigger is a great way to push through Elder. Like you're st- you're playing your stupid seven mana six eight like vigilance or reach or whatever they are the seven seven Vigi. Having Nyxborn Hydra to then put on those giant Eldrazi and give them trample is pretty important. So. I, I, this is this is now I'm gonna I'm gonna say be you and I'm gonna say I'm gonna push back and okay. I don't think this card is very good because what you're describing like those there is no shortage of stuff to do in the big mana space and this is so inefficient otherwise and it's not even that efficient like when you're doing the thing because the bestow cost is X green green so you have to spend so much mana to get that like boost on your Eldrazi token that I just don't think decks need that i don't know I, i've seen i've seen this cast a few times i just don't think it does very much have you seen it bestowed yeah like i found a lot of times on turn seven or eight like you've got seven eight lands and like five eldrazi spawn laying around and making this your thing plus 11 plus 11 trample is just game over at that point yes that just seems like such a narrow scenario to me Oh, I, I had a, I had a, de- I mean, maybe my deck was just weird, but I had a deck that really wanted its one copy of Nyxborn Hydra. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it for those kinds of decks. This next one is juicy. This is another one of my pet cards. <laughs> Viscerator's Insight, one in a black for an instant, is an initial cost to cast it, sack an artifact or a creature, draw two cards. It's got flashback for four and a black. The first copy of this is very good. I think in every black deck, it's at the intersection of draw three for blue black sacrifice stuff graveyard value it, it just does so much it's it looks clunkier because of the costs on both but the fact that you get to flash it back is premium I, i've really liked eviscerator's insight yeah I, I agree with you on like it's got diminishing returns but i think the first copy is something a lot of black decks want takes us on to phyrexian ironworks tuna red for an artifact at uncommon whenever you attack you get an energy and you can tap pay three energy to create a three three colors Phyrexian Golem artifact creature token. Activate only as a sorcery. The thing that I just was wrong about this card. I thought you wanted whenever you attack, you get an energy. And I just thought it was a bad way to produce energy. But what you actually want is the energy sink. Like you want you want to be able. This to is tap, just a good place energy. to put energy. It's like a yes, free a great three, place. Three. To, yeah, yeah, a great place to put energy. So all well, of a sudden, all your things that make three energy instead of like they're a two two plus a three three for three mana, yeah, whatever, which is insane. Right. Yeah, you're playing the like the the white blue common, the white blue two two flyer brings three energy. It's like okay, so now it's a two mana two two flyer that makes a three three. 
Yes. That, that's that's awesome. what Phyrexian Ironworks is, and it's very powerful at that. Yeah. Uh, we talked about discovering this yesterday. It's a skittering precursor, two and a red, three, three with menace that has devoid. And whenever you sack a non token permanent, you make an 01 colorless Eldrazi spawn creature token. So this works with the fetch lands. The common fetch lands trigger this and give you free spawns. Yeah, very cool. Next on the list, we've got Breaker of Creation. This is six colorless colorless for an 8-4 uncommon Eldrazi. Whenever you cast a spell, you gain one life for each colorless permanent you control. It's got hexproof from each color, and it's got Annihilator 2. The thing I didn't realize about this was it counts lands. Did you know that? I think at one point I did and then forgot it and then remembered it again. Like my it's... opponent cast this and they gained 12 or something. And I was like, wait, what? What is bugged right now? And then I realized it counted all eight of their lands. Yeah. It's, this card, you ramp this out against aggro. It's single handedly just grinds the game to an absolute halt. Yeah. Well, and the, and the hexproof from each color just means like you can't kill it outside of combat. Correct. So like you're you're not only going to get the thing to stabilize you, but then you're going to get to decide like how you want it to die. Like, do you want to attack and trade off a thing and annihilate or two? Are you leaving it back to block their their three power things, whatever? Like it, it's it's really good. It's so much mana, though. It is a lot it's of mana. so much mana. I, I just I'm not sure how great this card is like. I think it's pl- you can get there pretty quick with writhing chrysalis writhing chrysalis is so unfair writhing chrysalis rules yeah for sure <laughs> so unfair yeah uh next evolution witness i just i want to sing this card's praises one more time sure it's two, two green for two one one and a green adapt to the when you have ways to repeatedly put counters on this it's so good and it if you're playing against it it's kill on sight like you you cannot leave this thing well, laying around on the battlefield and, he, and to like go back to my or not go back, but this is sort of a, an exception to my point about commons is that this is a common and you can get multiple copies of it. And so then they kill one and you're like, OK, here's then the it, other yes. one. And that's going to get back the evolution window. So like it gives you a grindy engine at common. That's pretty cool because I think the pieces are there in the rest of the format to support that. This is a yeah, this is a eternal witness that common that's also kind of aggressive, like it can beat down that's pretty a, hard. A four three. Yeah. Yeah, cards excellent. Uh, Area auxiliary. This has been very impressive as well in tandem with uh, just aggressive strategies, but also especially in tandem with the cards that care about plus one plus one counters being placed on them. It's three and white for three three flyer. When it ETBs, you support two. Feel pretty confident that area auxiliary is the best white common over inspired. I'm not on board with it over inspired inventor. Just because of how flexible inspired inventor yeah. is. Yeah, like area auxiliary. I mean, it does what I think white does best which is like body like and what it, what it says is that all you have to do is just draft things that cost two and three mana and then you play area auxiliary and all of a sudden auxiliary is four mana for five five two of which has haste right now um and three of which has flying but like inspired inventor just like says you get to do whatever you want and this will help you do that i don't know yes like i think it's just different things. The floor on Inspired Inventor is much higher in the draft and in the gameplay. The ceiling on Area Auxiliary is higher. Right. The, and here's here's something that, that I started to think about, and I never. I, I know we're, we're this episode's going long here, but you know we argued a lot about grades last week. I think mostly for the good of the content. I do think like the grading scale is something to revisit or something to think about shifting to something else for next crash course, whatever. But one of the things I hadn't framed it in, like I always think about grading cards of like where I want to take them in the draft and not about how I expect them to perform, you know, cause the metric we have when we talk about the data, we're talking about game in hand win rate. We're talking about when you play this card, what's it doing for you in terms of winning Area yes. Auxiliary is going to have a higher win rate than Inspired Inventor. Like, f- I would put money on that right now. Does that mean that I want to draft it high? Like, is it higher in my pick order because of that? I don't know. And that is like part of I my... I think it should be, right? Don't you want to win more? Isn't that like... that? Well, that's a great question, right? Sh- so should I just be saying like, okay, well, Area Auxiliary is going to win me more games 
But do I, is that the only thing I'm valuing when I'm drafting? Not necessarily. I'm valuing flexibility. I'm valuing buoying up other cards. Whereas like auxiliary is the card to buoy up with other picks. Such an interesting conversation. Uh, the thing I would push back, I would say area auxiliary is flexible, more flexible than you think, because it's exactly what, like, it goes in all the same decks Inspired Inventor goes in. It's great in red, white energy aggro it's great in green white counters it's good in white black because you have a lot of small things like you're gonna have some of the black cards at what okay one, plus one plus one counters sold. put them but i think i'm sold and i think i need to shift i think weirdly i have just been always thinking about grading cards as where i want how i want to draft them and not about how i expect them to perform in the game maybe that's why we always have such great differences because i i definitely grade on when I play this card, how good do I expect it to be? Yeah, because I'm thinking about all this other stuff of like when I want to draft it and what it means for the draft and the flexibility and the blah, 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 like the percent that it's likely going to end up in my deck. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Right. Okay, I I'm in for area auxiliary is number one. Uh, and then just a couple more cards to chat about. Fang Flames, one in red for a common. Devoid deals four damage to our creature Planeswalker. If it would die this turn, exile it instead. You said you felt kind of whatever about this. I have not cast it yet. But every time it's been cast against one of my cool creatures, like my <laughs> obstinate gargoyle or like uh -huh. stuff that I, I've done a lot of graveyardy things, it's been pretty backbreaking. The exile has been relevant. I, I th let's not misconstrue me saying I don't think it's the, one of the top three red commons with I don't think this card is good. OK, so you do think it's good. I think it's good. I just think that one galvanic discharge is nuts. Yes. It's like one of the one of if not the best common in the set. And then I think Molten Gatekeeper and Smelted Charge Bug, maybe not in that order, are just such flexible threats in the format. And that's more what I'm interested in than one in a red sorcery speed kill most things. Yes. Okay. I buy that. The last card I want to shout out is Mindless Conscription, just as a, a thought for how to draft the format before mm -hmm. we go here. It's two and a black ETBs, and whenever you draw your third card each turn, you amass zombies three. So already up front, this is a three mana three three with plus one plus one counters, which is mm -hmm. something you're interested in in the format, I think, synergistically. And then it this is a type of card where you see this and you think, oh, this goes in blue black. But I would encourage you to try to look outside that for a lot of cards. So, for example, this combines great with Eviscerator's Insight, the one in a black sack of thing, draw two cards, or Fetid Gargantua, four in a black, four, four at common, two in a black adapt two. Whenever the counters are placed on it, you draw two cards, lose two life. Those are just self-contained like a, as a package in black. If you take your mindless conscription, you don't draft blue black. And then you maybe you put an Eviscerator's Insight and a Fetid Gargantua in your deck with mindless conscription. It's already good enough on its own. And then if you ever hit that combination of those two cards or those three cards, it can just kind of pop off. So past like big synergy, trying to look for smaller synergies like that. And they're they're all over the place. Well, in the and format. I, I'm already thinking at, about things that I hadn't thought of as you're talking about that, which is like this gets this is a four four with Cursed Wombat, right? Mm hmm. This uh, just gives you an additional modified creature for that uncommon bite spell that puts a counter on something and then has all your modified stuff bite something like I, I just I hadn't even thought about that I had literally just I did what you said I looked at the card I was like this is a blue black gold card nope yes but it's not like the, yeah. there's cards that look like can, they are and only slot in one thing but actually slot oh, it gives you a ta gives you a tower of counters for nesting grounds you can just move your counters <laughs> off of the amass token <laughs> Yeah, this this format, oh, this format's so good. I don't know if we've said that outright. This yeah. format's so good. I think we definitely have. I think we definitely have. I'm excited uh, to see what happens this week. Yeah, this format's going to be a juicy to podcast about. Yeah. Uh, so good luck to everybody in your early access. Not your early access, your, your regular access. access, access, you access. Plans. Sorry to rub it in. <laughs> But anyway, great, great place to wrap us up. Thank you, as always, to Salty Pretzels for our intro and outro music. Make sure you give it a listen. You can find all of our content on our website at lordsoflimited.com. You can find links to our tier lists, our MH3 tier list. Ben was tirelessly revising yesterday, so that should be up to date for you. Um, you can find links to our episode backlogs, our Twitch streams, our YouTube channel, our merch, courtesy of TeePublic, and our Patreon page, all at lordsoflimited.com. If you've got any feedback about the show or any questions, shoot us an email at lordsoflimited at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next week for another episode of Lords of Limited. Thanks, everybody. See you later. <laughs>